You may have heard the term event TV before, but not as prominently as you might once have done. The term has slowly leaked out of media-related discourse because the phenomenon of event TV is closely linked to live TV, and live TV isn't really as important as it used to be. In terms of things like, you know, the Super Bowl, sure people watch that live and always have done, sports are just different. But in terms of narrative TV, there's never going to be another event like the 28th of February 1983, where over 100 million Americans were sat down watching the last episode of MASH at the same time, because achieving anything like that again in the modern world is just not realistic considering the sheer amount of media outlets begging for your attention and your money. By the way, did you know that I have a Patreon? Link in the description, like and subscribe. In past decades, we only had four TV channels in the UK and no internet. So what are you gonna spend the evening doing if you've just got home from work if you're not going to watch one of those four TV channels? Read a book? Actually spend time with your children and or significant other? Of course not, what sort of stupid idea is that? So you're gonna sit and watch some TV. The biggest show of the night will be on at about 9 p.m., after everyone's had dinner, before they go to bed, and because that's typically people's routine and there's only four channels to choose from, chances are that everyone's watching the same thing at the same time. And so they go into work the next day and talk with their co-workers about something they watched on TV last night around the water cooler while putting off going back to their desks and doing some actual work. And you want to be involved in this conversation because it will help you form a connection with your colleagues. So you've got to be watching what everyone else is watching. And if the conversation is about a show put out by, say, Channel 4, that proves that Channel 4 have cultural influence and raises awareness of their brand, and grants them more attention and opportunities for future successes. If you like something that Channel 4 just put out, then maybe you'll like whatever they do next that's sort of similar. The culture of water cooler moments where it comes to the previous night's popular TV show created this desire from broadcasters for the thing I just mentioned, termed event TV. How do we make it so these water cooler conversations are more likely to be about what we've just put out? We heighten the drama and the perceived importance of what we're putting out, and we increase the pressure on people to keep up with these things, leading up to the show creating this big event, where it feels like everyone is talking about the same TV show. Usually it's a series finale. And the last episode of MASH is a prime example of this, and it just is harder to do this now. Nowadays, when your average person gets home from work, their choices aren't limited to watch TV, read a book, or engage with their significant other and or children if they can really be bothered. Now they've got the internet. Now they can waste their evenings doom-scrolling social media and having pointless arguments with dipshits like me. And given that nowadays shows can be put on streaming services where they can be watched whenever you want, if there's a show that everybody's talking about, you can put it off till the weekend maybe. Sure, in previous decades there was VHS recording, but you needed to remember to set the VCR to record and have enough blank tapes stored up. Saving shows for later is much more convenient now. And you will still get in on the cultural conversation eventually. There's just no urgent need to do it now, and quite often people don't bother. Maybe you'll end up missing a water cooler moment now that it's not rigidly tied to the morning after a show's time slot anymore. But you know what's also made engineering water cooler moments harder? The fact that Every show wants to be the show on everyone's lips. Now there's not just a million streaming services and channels where the UK used to only have four, as well as there being a million other ways to spend your free time, there's also what feels like a million shows vying for your attention in a desperate bid to be the subject of the next water cooler conversation. And paradoxically, this means that water cooler conversations are less likely to happen. Nowadays, an attempted starter to water cooler conversation about a popular show goes something like this. So, have you seen this show on Disney Plus? No. Have you seen this show on Amazon Prime? No. And the conversation just gets brought to a screeching halt. It's just not as high a chance you were both watching Channel 4 last night anymore because neither of you had anything better to do. And even if you are watching the same show as with something massive like Stranger Things, these conversations about the show you're watching still get stymied and can't be these weekly ongoing things like they used to be. Because Netflix went all in on the binge watching model of streaming shows about 10 years ago. And to this day, they still stupidly dump entire clumps of episodes out all in one go. So no one's watching it at the same pace anymore. Oh my god, I loved episode 6. No, don't spoil it, I haven't got there yet. So, you can't talk about it, because the person who loved episode 6 will have moved on to something else by the time the person watching it at a slower pace has got there. The binge-watching model of streaming series has been kind of annoying because it's killed unfolding conversations over the course of several weeks. 
I've actually found it quite refreshing when there's been a streaming service that's put up one episode at a time, as happened a few years ago with WandaVision, where suddenly I was having water cooler conversations again regarding the question of what do you think this weird thing is doing and why. That was why Lost was so popular. The answers to its questions may have been disappointing, but we all enjoyed the process of talking about what we thought was going on with it. But still, Stranger Things has become what used to be termed as event TV. When a season of Stranger Things comes out, it's as if everyone is talking about it, and anything in its peripheral cultural zone suddenly gets a boost in attention. When season 1 came out and reviews kept comparing it to Spielberg movies, I was suddenly having conversations about E.T. and Jurassic Park for the first time in decades. As everybody knows, they used the Kate Bush song in season 4 and suddenly that was everywhere. There's ultimately two reasons that a show becomes a piece of event television that everyone's going to talk about. Stranger Things does one of them, and that's tap into something that everybody knows about already. The industry is obsessed with finding ways to revitalise old franchises because something that worked before has a precedent behind it. But that doesn't mean the industry isn't open to new IP and that everything has to be a reboot or a remake of a franchise that was popular already, as Stranger Things wasn't when it first got massive. But it needs these recognisable elements that remind people of something that they know about. And it's got to be something that everyone knows about. If you read books about pitching TV shows and movies to production companies, studios and agencies, the endless bit of advice you'll get is to try and sell it as its popular thing meets another similar popular thing. Stranger Things openly did this. It's old Spielberg movies meet Stephen King novels. These things are popular, everyone knows about them, and so the show became massive and now when a new season drops it's everywhere. You can actually read the original pitching document for Stranger Things on ScreenCraft. Early in development it was called Montauk, and it name drops things it's similar to all the time. Jaws, Poltergeist, Stand By Me. It built its status by associating itself with successful things. But it's not just nostalgia that does it. There is another route to becoming a piece of event television. Not everything that becomes this grand event for people is rooted in nostalgia. Squid Game basically came out of nowhere and became one of the most watched shows ever in an incredibly short space of time. Yes, Squid Game also had cultural comparisons made about it in the same way as Stranger Things. People brought up The Hunger Games, which itself was adapted from a popular series of young adult novels, which in turn had been compared to Battle Royale. But Squid Game's structure, whereby episode by episode our characters are made to play children's games and main cast members get brutally killed off one by one, supports my central thesis about what makes a good piece of event television. And that thing is death. Death always gets people talking. Squid Game's genius is rooted in the fact it dedicates a large chunk of its runtime to getting us to care about our characters. The whole of episode 2 is dedicated to showing us their families, their hopes, their dreams, what they want out of life, in painstaking detail. It explains why they feel they have no choice but to chance their lives in a deathmatch. And I was so compelled to watch it because even though it's kind of inevitable that it's going to kill off everyone except Gi Han because, well, he's the main character, he's this dopey, lovable puppy dog of a man, but I was on the edge of my seat interested to know when characters I'd come to care about were going to die and how their deaths will affect me. And that'll drive conversations I have about it afterwards. I'll share my feelings about how devastating the end of the marble game was. The sheer brutality that Squid Game approaches characters that it's dedicated a lot of care and effort into crafting reminded me of the last time that everyone was talking about a show that played fast and loose with characters' lives. Game of Thrones! Hey, remember when people actually liked Game of Thrones? That was fun. Granted, Game of Thrones was adapted from a series of books, so it's also rooted in something that people had a cultural awareness of already, but not on the same scale. Most of the people I talked to in the aftermath of the Red Wedding hadn't read the books and didn't know the sudden death of multiple characters was coming. The general cultural zone of Game of Thrones was the start of the conversation, but to heighten the emotion, to heighten the drama, to make it a piece of event television, a major incident involving something of high emotional value is what drives a piece of event TV. And the highest emotional event possible is the death of a long-running beloved character. Squid Game took this thesis to its logical conclusion by making it a case where either the potential for one of these high emotion incidents or a high emotion incident itself happens in basically every episode. Granted, Squid Game, like Stranger Things, is another of those dump the entire thing and run affairs where the conversations would have been much more enjoyable if they were these communal experiences happening on a week-by-week -week basis as the momentum of the show gathers pace. 
and people indulge in theories about who's going to die next and how that's going to change the dynamic. The slowly building cultural wave that Squid Game created was still fun. It was still an event for people. But it wasn't event TV in the traditional sense of a show building its cultural influence as a story unfolds leading up to an allotted time slot where everyone has to gather around the TV at the same time to see how the story ends, like with the last episode of M.A.S.H. I do think it's a shame that narrative TV has moved away from the slowly unfolding stories seen in linear TV. On one level I get it, streaming is more convenient for people, keeping up with shows is exhausting, especially when there's so many of them. And to some degree the conversation is as urgent as it used to be because you want to avoid spoilers. But it is odd that almost all narrative TV is dumped out like this while linear TV actually does still exist. Linear TV is mostly made up of reality shows now, which usually follow the pattern of week by week high emotion incidents to generate ongoing water cooler conversation. However, said conversations aren't quite so universal anymore because the type of subject matter that reality TV deals with, you know, does this person like this other person or not, is only going to be considered important by a specific type of audience. But there are lessons that streaming narrative TV can learn from the way that linear reality TV operates if it wants to create these cultural events where everyone is talking about the same show. You'd think a reality show would never be able to capture an audience like, say, me. But there is one show that's done it, that's managed to marry the ongoing weekly conversations of reality TV with the high emotion intensity of narrative TV. I never expected to end up watching the British iteration of the international reality game show format, The Traitors, but somehow I got suckered into the ongoing conversations around it as it was airing week in, week out early this year. I had ongoing conversations about a piece of linear TV leading up to the finale, and narrative TV hasn't really given me an experience like this in years. In many ways The Traitors is like Squid Game. A bunch of strangers are invited to a castle in a remote location, and a few of their number are designated traitors, who kill off their fellow contestants each night. I mean, not literally kill them of course, they just leave. The show does not actually murder its contestants, because imagine the amount of risk assessments you'd have to do on a show that actually did that. For all intents and purposes though, the contestants are theoretically killed off, they vanish after they've been killed and everyone talks about them as if they've actually been murdered and emotions get heightened. So functionally it is a death match, and the cliffhangers were vital in making the traitors event TV for everybody. The favourite contestant of season 2 of the UK edition was Diane, and in episode 6 the traitors have to kill someone by getting them to drink from the quote unquote poison chalice without realising it. And the episode cuts off at just the point where traitor Miles hands Diane the poison chalice, but before it touches her lips. And then the episode ends, and everyone was left for days after that wondering whether Diane actually drank from it. Even though it was pretty obvious she would, that cliffhanger left everyone with the space to come up with theories as to why this wasn't the ending that it seemed to be for a popular character. And for me, and a good chunk of Twitter, whether or not Diane survives became one of the most important questions that's ever been asked. Maybe she'd put the chalice to her lips, then think about it and say, actually, you know what, I think I've had enough for the night. Emotions were even higher in the build up to Diane's quote unquote death. It didn't feel like I was watching a game show anymore. It felt like I was experiencing this grand cultural event where a character on a TV show that everyone's come to care about is about to die. So event TV, where everyone's watching and talking about the same show and the build up to an event episode is still possible in the realm of linear TV. And this is something that the era of dumping an entire series of narrative TV on a streaming service can learn from you build up a cultural momentum over a series of weeks. Nostalgia is a good shortcut to creating momentum, but it's not vital. Hook people in, sow some seeds that a high emotion incident is coming, and then be as utterly ruthless as possible when you're ready to be. That's what creates the type of event that people are going to be talking about around water coolers that, importantly, they're probably going to remember in years to come.